الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم مباركا بن محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين <coughs> So as always we uh, begin by thanking everyone who came out to the masjid today to join us for the Monday meeting leaving your homes and leaving the comfort of your home and coming to the masjid and joining us and being here in person for the Monday meeting. We thank you for that. Uh, before we get started, uh, there's a few uh, housekeeping things that we'd like to uh, attend to. The first one is that we want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the fast of those who made it a point to fast today and to reward them for their fasting. Amin ya rabbal alameen. We also want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we also want to thank first and foremost and then ask Allah to reward our sponsors, the ones who are providing the water, the dates, and the finger foods for the iftar. Uh, the third housekeeping matter is that not this coming weekend, but the following weekend, the clocks will go back, the time will change. And that means that following Monday, November the 8th, uh, Salat al-Maghrib will be around, right around the 5 o'clock hour. Now obviously, uh, we will not be able to continue doing the Monday meeting at that time. People are just getting off work, people won't be able to make it here, etc. And so what will happen uh, is that we will move the start time of the class to after Salat al-Isha which will be somewhere between uh, 6.30 and 7 o'clock, depending on how everything falls out or shakes out. So the time that we'll be starting will be similar, but it'll just be connected to Salat al-Isha as opposed to Salat al-Maghrib. Now the question comes, how will that affect um, our weekly iftar? And so there are some uh, discussions about uh, whether or not we should just continue it. We have sponsors. And so there'll be food here for anyone who's, who's here. And that may be the case, I have to discuss it with the Sheikh. Uh, but uh, the concern about that is, okay, if we have the food here and we just leave it there for whoever wants it, somebody has to clean that up, somebody has to police that. And if we don't have anyone dedicated to do that, that could be problematic. So the logistics have to be worked out. But there may still be iftar here every day for those who fast on Mondays. We just have to uh, figure out the logistics. And once that gets determined and sorted out, uh, we will notify you, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyib, um, so over the past few weeks, we have been commentating or commenting on selected verses from Surah Al-Hujurat. And we mentioned previously that Surah Al-Hujurat is a surah, a chapter, the greater part of which Allah dedicated to counseling the believers on how to achieve Muslim unity and a cohesive Muslim community. He counsels them in this surah on their interpersonal relations and he warns them against those behaviors that can sow discord, sow the seeds of division and cause the believers who should love one another to despise one another instead. So last week we talked about, or we commented on the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He instructed the believers to investigate and confirm reports from less than credible sources. Because a great deal of harm can come when we act upon and we retransmit information which we have not confirmed. And so Allah counseled us, to avoid doing this because of the harm that it, it can do to individuals and the harm it can do to the Muslim community. Tonight, we will contemplate the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُّحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ إِنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِحْتُمُوهُ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَوَّابٌ رَحِيمٌ so inshallah tonight we're going to contemplate the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says And do not backbite one another Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? 
you would definitely hate to do so. So likewise, you should hate backbiting and fear Allah. Allah is ever accepting of your repentance, merciful. So Allah, He says, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا And do not backbite one another. So what does it mean to backbite someone? The Prophet ﷺ provided the definition of backbiting, the Islamic definition of backbiting, in the hadith collected by Muslim on the authority of Bihurairah, in which he said to his companions, there were a group of them gathered together, and he said to them, he said, Atadruna Malghiba. He said, Do you know what constitutes backbiting? Qalu Allahu wa Rasuluhu A'lam. They said, Allah and His Messenger know best. We don't have an answer. So we'd like you to tell us, Ya Rasulullah. فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ ذِكْرُكَ أَخَاكْ بِمَا يَكْرَى He said, backbiting is when you mention your brother in his absence. I want you guys to pay attention to this definition. Because I want you to tell me what boxes we have to check in order to say, yeah, backbiting has occurred. So he said, ذِكْرُكَ أَخَاكْ بِمَا يَكْرَى he said it is mentioning your brother in his absence in a manner that he would not appreciate if he were present. فَقَالَ أَحَدُ مِنَ الْقَوْمِ So one of the people who was sitting in the gathering, he said, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَفَرَعَيْتَ إِنْ كَانَ فِي أَخِي مَا أَقُولُ He said, well, what would you say, O Messenger of Allah, if what I'm saying about my brother is true? Like, if I said, for example, he's dishonest, and he really is dishonest, what would you say about that? Would that be backbiting? فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَىٰ آلِهِ وَصَحْبِ سَلَّمْ He said, إِن كَانَ فِيهِ مَا تَقُولْ فَقَدْ اِكْتَبْتَ وَنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِيهِ فَقَدْ بَحَتَّ He said, if your brother is as you say, if what you say is true, then you are guilty of backbiting. But if, he, if what you say is not true, then you have slandered him instead. Now you're guilty of a different sin. You've what? You were guilty of slander. If you speak about him behind his back and what you say isn't true, then you've slandered him. You've done something even, even worse. طيب, so now let's circle back. And you tell me, and I'm going to give you a hint. There are four conditions for something to be called backbiting. Four conditions. What are the four conditions? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What are the four conditions? We can do it together. We can do it as a collective. Somebody give me one and we'll work from there. Ha, Say, talking about it behind your back. Like when you're not there. Okay, give me a condition. You're just... Repeating the hadith, you're being slick. You gotta be hazen. This is what it is. Give me a condition, something that it's a characteristic of backbiting. Four characteristics of backbiting. At Hussam. So, say if like one of the, if someone Okay. <laughs> this sounds like like real life right here. Like you, you know, you, you're dry snitching right now. Like suppose your brother, he said he made salah, but he didn't make salah, and he said he made. It's like you're dry snitching right now, Hussam. So, so after that, uh huh. He did that just so he could get on video games. After he did it, just so he could get on the video game. Very explicit example. Yeah, the brother shit. Tell the brother. Tell it. Oh, that's a very good story. I like that. But I'm looking for four characteristics. Should I repeat the hadith? Will that help you guys out? Because nobody's responding. He said, do you know what constitutes backbiting? They said, Allah and his messenger know best. We don't have an answer. Could you tell us? Ya Rasulullah. He said, 
it is mentioning your brother in his absence in a manner that he would not appreciate. He went on to say, if what you say is true, then you're guilty of backbiting. Huh? Honesty. So one is that what you say has to be true. It has to be true. Ahsan, that's one characteristic of backbiting. Because if what you're saying is false, it becomes something else. Ahsan, that's one. Atfadali. Uh, in, intent has nothing to do with it. Intent has, and notice the prophet didn't mention intent. It's like if you do this, you're guilty of backbiting, irrespective if you had good, had good intention. At the Sheikh. Absent. A person has to be absent. If, if for example, there's a brother Farid, and I say Farid, you're a liar. He can't say, "Oh, you're backbiting me." No, oh, you're right here. <laughs> you see that? So he has to be absent. Absent. Yes. Okay. What else? We got two left. Person was here, you wouldn't appreciate it. Ahsant. It has to be something negative. Something you wouldn't appreciate. If I say, Farid, man, you're so handsome, brother. Farid, you're so intelligent. Oh, you backbite me. No, I'm, I'm saying good things. Right? You guys see that? So that's three. One more left. One more left. Very important one. If it's not true, then you're saying. Okay, we said about truth. Ahsant. And if it's not true, it'll be something else. Ahsant will be slander. But there's one left for, for backbiting specifically. It, it, it came at the outset, too. Ahsant, he said, Dhikuka Akhak. This word Akhak is not by accident. He said, mentioning your brother. The person has to be a Muslim. So, for example, if I'm at the office and I say, man, that dude right there is lazy. And he's a non Muslim. In Islam, that's not backbiting. Is it a good thing to do? No, but it's not backbiting. It's not backbiting. It's not. Not in Islam. It's not. Because the Prophet defined it Islamically, in Islamic terminology, as what? Dhikruka akhak ila akhrihi. To the end of the hadith, he said, mentioning your brother. So we're guilty of backbiting if what? If, we, if, if there are four characteristics present. It has to be a Muslim. The person has to be absent. You have to say something which is true. And that true thing has to be negative. You guys see that? Check, check, check. A person guilty of backbiting. Now we live in the times of social media. Uh-huh. So you could be behind your computer. Now what if you do that? You say something about someone. Everyone sees it. But, the, you know, even the person you're talking about, would that be backbiting? Yeah, th that, 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 that would be at, at least in a very dangerous gray area. Because if he comes to know about it after everybody else has seen it, you still technically, you weren't, he wasn't in front of you. You didn't say it to him directly. So technically, even if, you, even if you say, okay, well, a day or so or a few hours after you posted it, I saw it. Well, other people saw it, and I hadn't seen it. So you spoke about me in my absence in a way that was negative. Yeah. So I think it would qualify, and a person at the very least would be in the danger zone. And you don't know what the matter is on. Exactly. It would be in the danger zone. Yeah. So it's better if, if you really got something to say, and he's like, oh, well, you know, I'd say it to his face. Then go and say it to his face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just message him directly. Yeah. But you... All right, so we got the definition out of the way. What is the likeness? What is it like? What is backbiting like? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, in this, in this ayah, that backbiting, trampling on the honor of your, of your Muslim brother or sister, dragging their name through the mud, and disparaging them in their absence, he says it is like eating the flesh of his dead carcass. It's like if you saw your dead brother on the road, on the side of the road, and you took out a knife and fork and you started what? Started going to town. Allah is saying that that is what backbiting is like. Now, when I said that, I saw some of the sisters and even some of the brothers. Their, their faces like, like turned. They were like un uncomfortable with that. You know, they, 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 they envisioned a Muslim dead on the road and actually somebody what? You know, eating that. They were like, oh, that's disgusting. That's exactly what Allah wants to do what? He wants to induce. He wants to invoke in us this feeling of what? Disgust. I'm sorry, disgust. This feeling of being repulsed by the thought of eating a human, let alone a dead human that just was, for example, just died in the road and let alone a Muslim dead human. He wants us to realize that both of these are wrong. Eating the flesh of your brother figuratively, eating the flesh of your brother literally, both of them are wrong 
And if you find one repulsive, you should find the other one equally repulsive. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this similitude. And it shows the faith of the people who were kind of disgusted by that, that yeah, the effect of the Qur'an or, or, or the effect that Allah intended to, uh, to induce through these verses, it was induced, alhamdulillah. Tayyip. Uh, now, when we study the ayah, one of the things that jumps out at us or should jump out at us is that backbiting is a sin. Backbiting is a, a sin. Not just any sin, it's a major sin as we're going to see. But I'm going to read the ayah again in English and I want you to pay attention and tell me where are the indications that it's a sin. Where are the indications in the verse that it's a sin? How is Allah sending us the message, hey, you know, red flag, red flag, flashing red light, this is a sin. So he says, he says, and do not backbite one another. Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? You would definitely hate to do so. So you, likewise, you should hate backbiting and fear Allah. Allah is ever accepting of your repentance. So what say you? Where are the indications in that verse where Allah is saying, this is a sin? Ahsant. One of them is the fact that Allah in the eye by saying, indicating that the one who does it is in need of his repentance. And he says, I'm, I'm ready to accept your repentance should you want to repent. Giving us the hint, hey, if you do this, this is a sin from which you have to repent. Right? You guys see that? That's an indication. Ahsant. Very good. Uh, maybe by saying, it's like eating your own brother's flesh. Liking it, liking it to what? A sin. Is it a sin to eat a human being? So when Allah likens it to a sin, He's saying what? They're equal in what? In sinfulness. Ahsant, very good, uh, Hatim. What else? The part where it literally says, do not backbite. Ahsant! <laughs> Ahsant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He prohibits it using what they call la and nahiya The la of forbidding. It means no or do not. Whenever you see that in the Qur'an, know that whatever follows it is absolutely what? Prohibited unless we have proof to the otherwise. Because this la nahi, as the scholars of Usul have said, to feed a tahrim. It's something which is indicative that Allah is prohibiting that thing. Tayyip, uh, one more thing that should jump out to us. Huh? Allah hates it. Yeah, but he didn't mention that in the ayah. But he did say something in the ayah. He said, what? Fakirihtumu, but somebody already said that one. If you insist, Hatim. And do not backbite one another. Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? You would definitely hate to do so. So likewise, you should hate backbiting and fear Allah. Allah is ever accepting of your repentance merciful. I kind of gave you a big hint there with the inflection, huh? And fear Allah. If Allah is saying and fear Allah, it's as if he's saying if you don't comply, if you do backbite, it's indicative that you don't have piety. You lack piety, you lack the fear of Allah. You guys see that? So it's a sin. You guys see that? So these are all the indicators Jazakumullah khairan that Allah gives us in the ayah. Let's look closely now at some of those expressions. So he said, Wattaqullah. He said, and fear Allah. How? How does Allah want us to fear Him in this verse? Tayyib. He wants us to fear Him by avoiding prohibited deeds generally. That's the way you fear Allah, because the word taqwa comes from waqa, which means to protect yourself from something that will harm you. And so Allah is saying basically, protect yourselves from what? From my punishment. How do you protect yourself from the punishment of Allah? By what? Yeah. By doing what He commands you to do and avoiding what He prohibits. So when Allah says, taqullah, generally in the Quran it means avoid the prohibited things. Do the things you're supposed to do and avoid the prohibited things. But in this ayah, when Allah says, Wattaqullah, He wants us to avoid something specific. Anybody want to guess? Ahsant, backbiting. He wants us to avoid specifically backbiting. Okay? And He also wants us, because we're human, if we fall into it, He wants us to repent. He wants us to repent from backbiting that we've done in the past or that we presently what? Are doing. Okay? Then He says, at the end of the ayah, he says, "Inna Allah tawabun rahim." Allah is ever accepting of your repentance, merciful. Means that Allah subhanahu wa taala accepts the repentance of those who 
they do certain things. One, they sincerely repent. They don't repent because there's something worldly in it for them. They repent because they honestly really want to be forgiven. They recognize that they made a mistake and they repent because they want to be forgiven. Number two, they fulfill the conditions of repentance. What are the three conditions for repentance? Anybody know? Okay, sincerity, we already covered it. One is that you have to cease and desist. You haven't repented if you continue doing the sin. I sent. What's the next one? Very important one. Asking for forgiveness. Is, From the person that you back bit. I sent. So that's, but that's part of ceasing and desisting, though. When you okay. cease and desist, you have to, if it's something that involves the right of another human being, you have to make amends or you haven't really ceased and desisted. So, for example, if the sin were you moving the property line of your neighbor onto their property, so you took three feet or four feet of their land, basically, and you want to repent from that, you have to move the property line back because otherwise you're still what? You're still engaged in the sin. So cease and desist goes hand in hand with making amends. So it's not a separate condition. It's what? It's part and parcel of that condition. But suppose, what's the essence of repentance? Feeling sorry. Feeling guilty. Feeling like you did something wrong. What they call a nedim, right? Remorse. So that's the first condition. After sincerity, remorse. Then cease and desist. Last condition is that at the time of repentance... You have to have this resolve, this, you make this promise to yourself, and more importantly, a promise to Allah, I won't do it again. If the opportunity presents itself, I'm not going to what? I'm not going to do it. You guys see that? Because we haven't repented if, if we say to ourselves, yeah, I, I, I'm not doing it now, but if, if the opportunity presents itself, I will do it. If you don't have that azm, ala an la ta'ud, if you don't have that resolve, I won't do it again, then you haven't really, you haven't really repented. So those are the conditions, and then Allah is merciful, as He says in the ayah, to those who abandon disobedience generally, and specifically they, they leave off or they stop backbiting, and they return to obedience. Once they realize, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm eating this person's flesh, they stop, they seek Allah's forgiveness, and they do what? They either say something good, or they remain, they remain silent. طيب now, uh, Don't you have to, the only way to offer repentance for backbiting is ask that person personal forgiveness for talking about you? Ahsanti, ahsanti. So one of the people, I don't know if the people in, in, in Clubhouse heard this, but uh, one of the sisters asked a very good question. She said, in order for your repentance to be accepted from backbiting, wouldn't you also have to go to the person whose back you bit and ask for their forgiveness? And there are some scholars, uh, particularly from the early period and then uh, throughout the centuries, who do hold that view. That you have to actually go to the person and seek their forgiveness. And there are other scholars, and I wish I remembered the names because there's some like heavy hitters in that in both on both sides of the debate. But one of the names I do remember on the second side of the debate, the, those who say that uh, the issue is more nuanced than black and white. Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, if a person believes or has reason to believe that going to the person and telling them, hey, I bit your back will only make it worse, that it will basically be like rubbing salt in the wound, then instead of going to that person and saying, hey, I bit your back, the person should instead Go to the same majlis, go to the same gathering where he said bad things and say good things. He should correct the record. He should also make dua for the person whose back he bit and make istighfar for him. And this will be the way that he makes amends <laughs> instead of going to him. And um, there are a number of proofs that they mention to support this general proofs in Islam that we don't make a bad situation worse, etc. And to be honest with you, when you study, the, or at least myself, when I study the issue, it looks like the people on this side are more correct. Honestly, if you go to a sister, if you go to a brother and you say, hey, I just want you to know, the other night I was having dinner with these people and I said this and this and this and this about you, is that likely to end well? I'm on, honestly, 
It's just not likely to end well. And Islam wants these relationships to what? To remain intact. It really wants the Muslims to be one ummah with hearts which are clean and pure towards each other, sincere love towards each other. And when, you, when, when people learn that you've said something negative about them, usually those feelings what? As much as a person might try to hold on to them, those feelings get lost. They can't. Um, so for that reason, it just seems like the best thing is for us to do as Ibn Taymiyyah and other scholars uh, suggested. We go to the gathering where we said negative things, we correct the record. We recant and correct the record. Number two, uh, we make dua for that person and we make istighfar on his behalf or her behalf. Tayyib. All right, let's go ahead and retrace our step and look at some takeaways. What if someone already told the person that you baptized? Yeah, then you're going to have to go and t- as, uh, as in the one the hadith says, make a, a tahallul. You have to go and apologize. Beg for their forgiveness. Yeah, that's what you got to do there. Uh, well, let's let get the sister and then we'll come to you. Ad uh, Fadli. You're saying if you don't go to him? If, say, like you make examples of different people at the individual black bite, you know, they see a friend that's hell of a time. And then they found out that it was true, or it wasn't true, but they were black bite their sister. And you said that it would cause more harm to confront the sister. Um, we're talking about now, to be clear, we're talking about if they don't know. Right. If they don't know what so, would. If they don't know. So, you're supposed to replace it with saying something good to the same group of people about that person. Right. So, it's like the still, it's like the person's not taking responsibility or owning up to that it's this backbite to that person, that sister. So, so I, just to be clear, that I understand your question, that you're saying that. If rather than going to that person who doesn't know what was said, rather than going to them and telling them, hey, I said X, Y, and Z. If you go to that same group of people and you say, hey, I said this, I shouldn't have said it, it was wrong. And you say good things in replace of it. I'm sorry, in place of it. And you make dua for that person, make istighfar. You're saying that that's not right because you haven't owned up or you haven't taken responsibility. No, I didn't hear it the first time I heard the Buzi that one of the things was that you um that you, you said to you that you said something inaccurate, something wrong about yeah. and vice versa. Yeah, you go back to them, the same people where you said those things you said those things and you go back and you correct the record to the same people. Uh that's for the If you said that they were dishonest, and they are dishonest, then what you're going to say is that the person is good, they have a good heart. You're going to say things, if it's true, and it's something like that, dishonesty, then you're going to say, I shouldn't have said that, because you shouldn't have. And you're going to say good things about them in place of this dishonesty. You won't retract it because, like you said, it's true and it might even be for their benefit. You understand what I'm saying? So it kind of depends. We're talking about generally. And there might be specific situations where it wouldn't be appropriate to what? To say they're honest because that, that's not really, really true. But you would say good things instead, if that makes sense. You would say good things instead. Tayyib, um, well, let, let me... Let me finish a few things and then I'll take your question. You had one though, right? Yeah. Ad Fadl Shaykh. Uh, in the verse, you said where Allah says, don't come near it. Would that be not listening to it as well? Because you don't have to be the one doing the backbite, but you're the one listening. Well, Ahsant, I mean, generally speaking, we don't have to necessarily commit a sin to be complicit in the sin. That, yeah, if you're present and you don't speak out against it and say, hey, you shouldn't be saying that, so that's backbiting. You become complicit. 
you become complicit. Yeah, and you'd have to repent just like because you're you're partially guilty. And then my other question was, we come from, you know, we convert to Islam. Right. So a lot of times when we're trying to give that or we speak it to our family, we know that you might fall into where they're the one backbiting against our other family members who are not Muslim. Uh huh. And then you were saying that to backbite a non-Muslim is not Muslim. So we're listening to it just to not say, hey, that's not that backbiting and things like that. Just tell them it's wrong. Because you know, we, 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 what we didn't say is that it's not wrong. Mm-hmm. We said, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not good behavior. Okay. We said it's just not in keeping with the Islamic definition of backbiting. Islam has given a specific definition for backbiting that requires repentance in Islam. So when these characteristics are present, you, you're guilty of a major sin in Islam and you have to repent from it. Mm-hmm. If those conditions are not there, it might be backbiting in, like culturally speaking, yeah. but it wouldn't be backbiting Islamically speaking. So we wouldn't have to go to all the family members and say, hey, you know, No, no, I don't, no. no. This, but, what you, what you, but what you should do is say, hey, can we not talk about, yeah. you know, others that are not present to defend themselves? You can say that. And that'll, uh, that'll quiet the discomfort that you have because I'm letting y'all know I'm speaking out. And you can just get up and walk off, too. Um, you. So let's look at some, some takeaways. But I, I, I did want to come back to the, the sister because um, she made a point uh, that... Uh, you're not taking responsibility. Um, there may be some truth to that. But what Islam does is it looks at evils. And if there's more than one evil in the situation, it tells us to take the lesser of the two evils. So I could say, yeah, I don't want to be a person who doesn't own up to what they said and did. I'm not, that's, not, that's not how I get down. So I'm just going to go and tell the person, Right. But if I do that and it destroys our relationship, I have two evils and one of them is worse than the other one. And I chose to do the worst of the two. You follow what I'm trying to say? So what Islam does, it says, yeah, take the lesser of the two evils. The lesser of two evils is, yeah, I'm not really owning up. And maybe that's a bitter pill for me to swallow. But from the Islamic perspective, it's better than losing the friendship and the brotherhood and the fraternity with my brother or sister in Islam, because I said these things and went and told them I said them, and they weren't able to, to, to pardon and forgive. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, if, if we understand, because there's something called the way we're built, the way we were raised, the way that, you know, the, the, the culture that we've developed and there's Islam. And Islam prioritizes certain things over what we may prioritize personally or culturally, etc. Part of submitting to Allah is, is this part. Is, this is how I'm built. But Islam says, in this case, you take the L. I, I take the L. And that's how I submit to Allah. I think this is... This is why these discussions that we're having and this, this surah that we're commenting on, it's so important for us, brothers and sisters, because I'm telling you, putting on a scarf, covering your face, and I commend the sisters who cover their faces, wearing long garments, keeping your garments above your ankles, praying five times a day, these are not really the hard things. They might be hard for some people, but they're not really the hard things. The hard things are these things. These are the hard things, man. When you submit and you do it Allah's way, how hard is it when somebody does you wrong to forgive them? How hard is that? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told Abu Bakr when his daughter was slandered by one of his relatives who he was financially supporting, and Abu Bakr didn't want to forgive him. Allah said, basically, in a roundabout way, forgive him. And then he said, he said, Don't you want to be forgiven by Allah? As if to say, if you want to be forgiven by Allah, you must first learn to forgive. 
And Abubakar said, yeah, I want to be forgiven. And he forgave. This is the, these are the hard things. These are the hard things. It's, this is Allah's way. So I'm going to do it Allah's way, even though if it were my brothers, I wouldn't do it like that. Not tafadali. So you're saying that asking the person is not prerequisite for you? Asking the person's forgiveness if you backbit them and they don't know about it? No, it's not a prerequisite. It would only be a prerequisite if they knew about it. <laughs> okay, so then ultimately it's up to you. What do you up to you what? To decide if you want to ask them. No, it's not up to you. There are two people basically. They're the people who know what you said and the people who don't know what you said. But if my sister doesn't know and I decide to go and ask her because I feel like it, But if you decide to and it destroys your relationship. It destroys your relationship. I'm, I'm, this, is, this is the greater evil. Yeah, this is just not how we should operate. And so I'm telling you, these relationships are so fragile. And, and if you look in the Quran, Allah is telling you, be careful. Don't do this. Don't step, like walk around on your brothers and sisters on eggshells. And it's tough. But what, what I don't understand. It's like some side talk. Sorry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I've had, I've had uh, experiences where people actually come and tell, told me, mm -hmm. and I actually respected that yeah, more for hey. than them going to a group. But let me ask yeah. this question, is that a personal choice, or is that something general, applicable across the board? Like, yeah, there's some people, personal. yeah, see, there's some people who are like you. Just like there's some people who can drink a little wine and be like, that's enough. But I'm going to ask you, most people, when they drink, most people, 80%, 85%, 90% of people, when they drink, they end up getting what? Drunk. When Allah gives us laws, does He give us laws for the 5%, for the 10%? He gives us laws for what? The overwhelming majority. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He prohibited alcohol, absolutely, although there are some people who actually will drink, they won't get drunk. Similarly, there are people like you. I would rather a person come and tell me what they said. Like you said, I will respect that more. But are most people like that? No, they're not. Most people are not like that. Once, you, once I hear that you say it, it changes it forever. It changes it forever. You're like, I thought you were my friend. Even if you don't say it to their face, inside yourself, you're saying, a friend wouldn't say that about me, behind my back. And trust me, I'm sh there's a lot of people in here nodding their head. A lot of people who live that experience, where somebody accused them of something, somebody called them something, and told them on their face. And after that, it was never the same. Even if they smiled at them, and they shook hands with them, and they hugged them after, you know, after they eat salah, it wasn't the same. It may never be the same. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want that in the hearts of the believers. Why? Because you can't go to war with people who you really don't love deep down. You can't sacrifice for people. You can't trust people. We need to be able to trust each other. These are the things that we have to understand. Allah is trying to, for us. To, he wants us to reach a greater height. Look at the Muslims around the world. Are they together? Are they one ummah? No, they're mutashatitin. They're, they're fractionalized. They're separated. They're divided. That's not what Allah wants for the believers. How can they achieve that? Look at the early Muslims. How did they used to be at war with each other? But they became, Allah brought their hearts together. How? By them living like this. By them following, giving them these instructions, and they follow those instructions. They cleanse their hearts of all the enmity and the hatred and the tribalism and all that, and they became what? One ummah. The way, the way we do that is one, by living in accordance with this, and two, understanding that when this is at risk, when this is at stake, then we sacrifice just about everything to preserve this, to preserve this unity. Which means, yeah, there's going to be situations where 
something might get said and it's like, you know what? I'm not getting ready to tell them that. Not because I'm a coward, but because it's not going to be the same. And Allah wants it to be the same. He wants us to be one ummah, one heart, you know, one brotherhood, one sisterhood. And sometimes in order to achieve that, you have to kind of like bury things. Not because you're a coward. And if you were on the other receiving end, you'll want them to tell you, but you do this because why? Because it's better for what? The ummah. You don't seem convinced. I, I don't know what to do to convince you. Oh, no, it's, it's eh. okay. I mean, there are two different sides, and eh. I can see the two different eh. sides, of course, but I just, I don't know. I've always respected that, and I would prefer someone to talk mm. to me about it versus always knowing that, and everyone else knows that, mm. and I don't. Mm -hmm. And then this person who I think my best friend, my sister in Islam, mm -hmm. talks about me behind my back. Mm -hmm. I mean, Allah knows best. Later on, it got away with it once. Might try to get away with it twice. Just remember this. Everything you're saying is either something applicable to the 5% mm -hmm. or it's something hypothetical. You got away with it once, you may do it again. Mm -hmm. But remember that the one who has given us these laws he has the wisdom which encompasses all the hypotheticals. And he's saying, hey, operate like this. Operate like this. It's good for you. And we just have to trust. Ad Fadli. Wa alaikum salam. Mm -hmm. Where you have to say, you know what, I'm not going to slander and tell her business or tell what happened, okay? But I summed it up in a nutshell, you know, to somebody else close to me. And I said, I'm going to forgive my daughter. And I said, and I said that because I want Allah. MashaAllah. And I want to keep my relationship with my, with my family. That's more important than letting the shaitan separate us. MashaAllah. Okay. So I did that only for the sake of my Lord. Alhamdulillah. Okay, and to keep my family together. So sometimes you have to play the bigger part. And you have to step up and be and take that. Okay? And you have to hold that because you want to do you want to keep that unity, you know, amongst yourself and in your family and in the community yeah. here. Because a lot of times, you know, and I'm gonna put it out there, we can do things, whether we Muslim sisters or brothers, that can be so hurtful to each other. Okay, and not thinking in depth, you know, somebody could hurt the sister, she comes to the sister Lori, I'm so upset. Ah. Okay, and like the brother was saying, oh, you're sitting there listening to it, so he has, you know, you held accountable. Okay, yeah, so there comes a level of, you know, playing field. The sister was so hurt, maybe she didn't look, probably didn't want to back by the person. You know what I'm saying? She's not thinking of, I'm backbiting you. But they fall in pain, and then I, I might listen and I say, okay, well, it's like counseling. Okay? If you go to a Muslim counselor and you say, okay, well, I'm dealing with this situation, you feel backbiting the person because the person ain't there. Okay? Now, if ain't no personal friend where you want to go up to the person and, and address the situ address that person, you're just going to leave it at general. You're going to leave it at general because you're going you're gonna to say what you're going to say, and that's it. Okay, now if I take it and run with it, that's another story. Walaikum salam. There are conditions though where you can talk about somebody without their asking place, for example. Yeah, there's some exceptions. There's some exceptions. And maybe um, next week, because uh, one of the things, I have a few points that I want to hit on. And then I was going to leave it at a point that we were going to address next week. So maybe we should also address the exceptions as well. Atfadl Shaykh. And a lot of times when I look at things like this, it's not always owning up to what you did to somebody as much as owning up to yourself. You know, if you look at it, I mean, Allah tells us, you know, we should we should love all of our brothers and our sisters, you know. So if you have a problem with a brother or sister, it might be something that you have 
yourself mm -hmm. inside of you. You know, so I feel like owning up by just, you know, talking to the people that you may have said it to and just owning up to it yourself and to Allah, you know. It, you're kind of owning up to it and doing that without speaking to the person directly. Oh, it's father's father. I think personally that we should, like, take up for brothers. Like, if we sitting out on the gazebo or whatever and brothers just start talking slick about somebody, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you don't have the, the wherewithal to stop the person from saying whatever he's saying about Fulan Fulan, at least have the presence of mind to get up and excuse you. Yeah, leave you, leave, yeah, leave. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, if we can't, if we don't have, sometimes, sometimes it, it's not in you to go against the grain, to swim upstream. Everybody's kind of like going with it. See people saying amen, this person saying it, and people, amen, amen, and you, you don't want to be the one that's saying, oh man, we shouldn't be saying this. Oh, what are you, the religious police? And some people are afraid of that. So like you said, at the very least, just get up. And remove yourself. Now, there, there are a few. I just want to touch on a few things uh, ala ujala before we close. And I'm, I'm kind of glad we had this discussion. It's, it, it's needed, especially around this topic, because it's a problem in the community. You know, I mean, these things that we're saying about backbiting are not like earth shattering. It's not something most Muslims know backbiting is wrong. Most of them know it's a major sin, but it, it happens a lot, doesn't it? In our community. So knowing is not enough. Knowing is only half the battle. It's like you know, not, it's, it's correcting the behavior. But there's a few points I want to hit on, and then uh, I'm going to conclude with, uh, with something, and then, uh, inshallah, we're going to probably have an extension of this topic uh, next week. Uh, the sister, Jazala Khair, uh, uh, mentioned that there are, as the scholars have mentioned, six exceptions to this rule. We probably should mention those. So we, we're aware of those. And then I also wanted to talk about uh, giving advice, because we're gonna, as we're going to see, one of the treatments for backbiting, one of the ways we can cure ourselves of backbiting is if we go to the person we have a problem with and, and talk to them, communicate with them, and in the course of that, maybe give them advice about some character flaw we see, etc. al uh, Muhim, so one of the things we take away from today's lesson is anytime we say something negative about a Muslim in their absence, we're guilty of what? Backbiting. Now, some people, when you say, hey, you're backbiting, the first thing you'll say is, um, well, it's true. Is that an excuse? No, because that's, that, that's what makes it backbiting. Because it's true. That's what makes it backbiting. If it weren't true, it would be what? Slander. So some people are quick to say, uh, oh, well, it's true, as if that absolves me of being of backbiting. No, that's what makes it backbiting. Also, some people will be quick to respond and say, well, if they were here, I would tell them. Does that absolve them of sin? Even if they're like, true, yeah, hey, I'm, I'm built like that. If they were right here, I would, I would say it. Okay, but they're not here. And so, you're backbiting. Um, backbiting is absolutely, if a person has all, if all those four characteristics are present in whatever a person says, then they are guilty of backbiting and backbiting is haram. It's absolutely haram, absolutely prohibited. And we mentioned the indications in the ayah that it's what? It's prohibited. Not only is it prohibited, it is unanimously agreed by the scholars it is a major sin. As mentioned by uh, Al-Qurtubi in, in his tafsir, Ibn Kathir in his tafsir, and other scholars uh, throughout the centuries. Tayyib, as we said, none of these things are earth-shattering. You all know it's haram. Sometimes we just need to be reminded. Because when we forget that it's haram, we, we become what? Laxadaisicum about backbiting, and it happens a lot. It happens a lot sometimes, it happens, and we don't even realize that we're committing it until somebody says, hey, 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 stop saying that, you're backbiting. And Ibn, uh, Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah he has a statement where he talks about how prevalent it is in the community. And this is Imam Ahmed in a time where the people were much more pious than they are nowadays. He said, لو كانت الغيبة تفطر ما كان لنا سيام من يسلم من الغيبة He has a statement where he says that backbiting invalidate a person's fast, no one's fast would ever be accepted. Who among people does not backbite? Well, it's a problem. And this is an alim saying this. He's saying like even my, my, my colleagues, we fall into this sometimes. You guys see that? So it's a problem for everybody. Everybody needs to work on this. And um, the other point I want to make is that, because we kind of touched on this in the discussion we had, and I hope when we have these discussions and we disagree, it's okay. Nobody should leave and they're salty. Islam is like this. And part of community is like this. Being able to have these discussions 
and not leave because I, didn't, because I didn't agree with you, you didn't agree with me, and now we're mad at each other. We should be, able to, we should be mature enough that we can have these discussions, and sometimes we have to agree to disagree. I don't really agree with you. No, you should go and tell the person, I don't agree with you, and I respect that. You guys see that? And we respect it. It's not, again, if, if the scholars of Islam differed about something, and they had two opinions, and you're convinced by opinion A, and I'm convinced by opinion B, those scholars, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't go in behind the mosque and, and, and beat each other down to see who, you know, who was right. They didn't. They agreed to disagree. We need to be mature and follow their example and agree to disagree. Y'all follow what I'm saying? So nobody should leave here, pardon my French, but her. Nobody should be. It's like, he didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't feeling what the brother said. Alhamdulillah. Y'all see that? Let me, let, me, let me swing back around now. Let me swing back a few more points so we can close out. طيب, when Allah prohibits anything, especially in this surah, because this surah is dedicated to what? Helping the Muslims become a cohesive Muslim community. He's prohibiting what he prohibits for good reason. He's doing it for all own good. We talked about this. We touched on it earlier. I want to come back. I want to come back and emphasize it. Allah doesn't want us to backbite. Why? Because it harms people. Raise your hand if you ever heard through a third party or whatever that somebody said something about you behind your back. Most of us have experienced it. Did it feel good? No. It does not feel good. It hurts. And Allah doesn't want the believers to be hurt. So that's one reason why Allah prohibited backbiting. Number two, it undermines community spirit. Because you don't want to get in the same foxhole. You don't want to go to battle. You don't even want to be friends. You don't want to even give salams to somebody who's saying bad things about you behind your back. It destroys community spirit. And Allah wants us to be what? A community. Hold fast to the rope of Allah altogether and be not divided amongst yourselves. Wants us to be united. You're not going to be united with somebody who's, talk, who's saying stuff about you behind your back. Type number three, it invokes the anger of who? Allah. That's another reason why Allah doesn't, doesn't want you to do things that are going to make him angry at you and force him. Forces, you shouldn't say that about Allah, but you get my point. To punish you, put him in a position where you have to be punished. He has to punish you. He doesn't want to punish you. But if you do sin after sin after sin, then you have to be what? You may have to be punished if Allah doesn't choose to show you mercy. And so we can see from these three examples, backbiting is bad for us, not just in this world, but in the hereafter. Allah wants good for us, brothers and sisters, we have to want good for ourselves. We have to want good for ourselves and learn how to what? Keep our mouth shut. You got something good to say? Say it. If you don't have something good to say, be quiet. We've got to help each other. You know what I mean? We've got to help each other. Sometimes you get weak and, it's like, mm, and you want to say something. You, you start to say it. The other person has to say, no, nope, don't, don't say it. It's backbite. Please don't say it because I'm, I'm going to be in trouble too. Right? But the last thing I want to say about this backbiting to come full circle is that backbiting, it doesn't solve it doesn't solve anything. Backbiting doesn't solve anything. It creates what? It creates more problems. Instead of solving the problem you have, it creates more. It creates more problems. Instead of speaking about the person, you should do what? Speak. No, speak to the person. Instead of speaking about the person, speak to the person. Give that person advice. In this way, you will achieve two things. You'll achieve two things. What's the first thing you'll achieve? The person who has this fault that you're telling everybody else about. And if you tell everybody else, can they do anything about it? Can they fix it if they're oblivious to it? But if you tell them, they'll be alerted to what? To their fault and they can do what? They can fix it. They can fix whatever it is that's wrong with them. I man, you're dishonest, man. You always be lying. I'm sorry to say it to you like that, but Ahi, you don't tell the truth. Nice, I'm... You're right, brother. Okay, so now what? He can work on it. But if I tell everybody else he's dishonest and he doesn't really, he's oblivious to the fact he's dishonest, how can he fix it? So that's the first thing. Speak to him because what? You'll achieve what? The person will be alerted and they can fix it. Number two. In many cases, when we backbite, what are we really doing? How oh, can you believe that, brother? He did this, he did this, he did this. What are we trying to do? Huh? Trying to vent, man. I just need to get it out, man. I just really need to say 
what's on my mind, get what's on my chest off of my chest. Well, guess what? If you go to the person and talk to them, you also achieve what? You achieve that too. You're venting, but you're venting in a way which is productive as opposed to a way that's counterproductive. You guys see that? So go and tell the person, hey, this is what it is. And this is something we don't do. This is what we don't do, we run and hide. I'd rather go and tell this person, oh, this brother did this, this brother did this, this brother did this. But I'm not fixing the problem, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, yeah, I'm not fixing the problem, I'm, I'm creating, I'm creating more problems. And so this is what I wanted to say. Um, and because we closed with this giving advice, I thought it would be good if next week we expanded on that. Giving advice and taking advice. And in addition to that, I'm going to take the sister's suggestion that we should also talk about the six exceptions to al ghiba When can you say something that's true about your brother behind their back that's not positive and it wouldn't be a sin? Uh, so we'll look at that, inshallah, those two things next week. Any questions, any comments, any critiques before we stop for the event? We have about five, six minutes. Uh, so, I mean, uh, what the sister was saying, it kind of made me remember uh, sort of like a talk that I heard from a, a, another speaker. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, I, I'm getting a lot of emails. People, was, you know, apologizing to me and seeking my forgiveness for backbite. And he said, I want everyone to know I've, I've seen them, and I forgive all of you. He said, but the people who intentionally said things about me, backbiting, slandering, he says, I want the hasana on me, the day of judgment, so I don't forgive you. Well. So I, I was like, you know, it kind of puzzled me when, when I heard that. But at the same time, it kind of, when she said that, it made me think, you know, of the person, because you get to choose what do I want to forgive from you? Mm -hmm. What you said was so, but at the same time, you know, of course, we all want to forgive because we want forgiveness. Yeah. But what about something like that? You know, can, I mean, <laughs> is that justifiable? Like, can you, is that okay or is that? Wallahi, um, the original rule and what is ex what we would expect is for a person to forgive. Not everybody's there. Not everybody's there. And that's the dangerous, that's the dangerous thing that we, we, we expose ourselves to if we commit these type of sins that involve somebody else's honor, that they may, may not choose to, 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 to forgive. And there's actually a hadith, the hadith of Abu Huraira, I want to say it's collected by Bukhari, in which he said that, man kanat indahu madlamatan. So the Prophet in this hadith, he said that if a person has somehow wronged his brother, basically sisters, he's wronged his brother by basically trampling his honor, or in some other way, he's wronged his brother. Let him make amends in this world. Before the time comes when there won't be any dollars or any cents, meaning the only capital that you will have is your deeds. Then the prophet went on to say that if the person has good deeds, he'll have to repay that person with his good deeds, which means that that person didn't what? Didn't forgive him. So that 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 that. that Spiritual debt has to be paid. And the only way you can pay it is with what? With your deeds. There's no dollars. There's no cents. And if you run out of good deeds, then you have to take what? His sins. Until he's satisfied. Now imagine if you got a line of people, a thousand people long. You still got to sort it out with them. You got to pay that spiritual debt, either by giving good deeds or taking sins. Which is why... We have to avoid this. We have to help each other avoid it because it's, it's, it's like it's like a, a sickness, like an addiction. We get frustrated and the, 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 the tongue starts wagging and, you know, we start flapping our gums. Next thing you know, you you backbit somebody. And you could be a person that someone doesn't want to speak to anymore. Like every time I talk to this person, they, mm -hmm. they 
get me involved in that life. So now mm-hmm. you're losing. Yeah, you want to get away from it because I don't want to be complicit. I don't want to be complicit. Uh, it's father's here. So like in the situation he brought up, right, you're, you're like one of the audience members of somebody that's backbiting. Mm-hmm. Uh, would the right thing to do, you know, kind of, because otherwise you have to repent. I mean, would the right thing to do would be stuff up and say, hey, like, I don't think we should be talking about this other person here. You know, was that, would that still call that you need to, you need to repent for, for here? No, once you, once you tell the people that you object to it, you disapprove of it, right. or you defend the brother, uh, then inshallah that would absolve you. But if they persist, you should just get up and leave. You. you should get up and leave. Ah, it's Fadl Sheikh. Hey. Like you might have said something about somebody without knowing. You hey. might have joked about some group of people, like a whole nation or a whole. Right. You know, a joke like we, we say back home, you know, and secluded some people in that joke. Right. For example, you know, and, um, and you don't remember who did you actually right. spend it over your years. Hey. What would you recommend? Yeah, if, if, if it's, if it's, a, it's a, a group of people and there's no way you can go. And seek their forgiveness. Like you can't go to them individually and ask for their forgiveness or make amends to them individually. Then you make amends uh, generally. You make dua for them. You seek, Allah's, you seek forgiveness uh, for them. And you seek Allah's forgiveness for you. That, that's basically w- what you can do. And Allah, His forgiveness is vast. His mercy is vast. And He understands, like you said, we make mistakes in a period of ignorance, a period we weren't necessarily practicing or we weren't as observant as we, as, we, as we currently are. And so you just, you seek Allah's forgiveness. That's what istighfar is there for. That's what a tawbah is there for. And Allah repeatedly tells in the Qur'an that He's tawab rahim in this ayah and, other, and throughout the Qur'an. And what that means is that when you sincerely repent, you sincerely repent and the means to do everything that's required is just not there for you. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Do what's within your wus'a within your capability, your capacity, and Allah will, will forgive the rest, inshallah, bidnillah. And with that, uh, we need to uh, close, uh, inshallah ta'ala. Thank you all for coming. Again, remember, November the 8th, the lecture will be after Salat al-Isha. So we have one more lecture after Maghrib. The time will change, and then we'll move the lecture to after Salat al-Isha. November 8th will be the first Monday after the time change. The first Monday when the lecture will be after Isha. Jazakum Lahir and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.